The Gun by C.J. Chivers is one of my favorite history books. Interestingly, it is also one of the only history books I know of that doesn't focus on people or institutions, but rather on an inanimate object. Nevertheless, this book serves as an amazing guide for military history from the late 19th century up to the modern day. Before we get into the book, subscribe and hit the notifications bell. YouTube's algorithm doesn't like content having to do with weapons or military history, so hit the bell so you don't miss anything. Also remember to like, comment, and share this video so I can make more content that you guys like. If you've noticed, I have a proclivity for weapons and their history on this channel. While I've focused mostly on ancient weapons, I actually have a stronger affinity for more modern weapons. As you might expect, I have lots of books about guns on my bookshelf. Most of these, however, are just glorified picture books. The Gun by C.J. Chivers is a different story. The Gun, written in 2010, won a Pulitzer Prize for its wartime journalist author. Through its pages, Chivers documents the history not only of the AK-47, but also small arms in general. After the foreword, Chivers starts his exploration with the American Civil War. At the time, muzzleloaders were the primary weapon for most soldiers. One man, Richard Gatling, began to change this with his invention of the Gatling gun. In the book, Chivers explores the development of the Gatling gun from early versions, similar guns at the time, and its reception by the US military and other markets. At first, the Gatling gun wasn't very popular, but with the advent of smokeless powder and cased cartridges, the hand-cranked battery revolutionized the battlefield of the 19th century and started the shift from rank-and-file volley fire to the trench warfare of World War I. But the Gatling gun was still more of an artillery piece than a gun, being very heavy and hard to move. A couple of decades later, Shivers explores the next step in firearms development with the Maxim gun being the first true machine gun, and much lighter than its American counterpart, the Maxim gun further revolutionized warfare, setting the standard for firepower until the Second World War. The Maxim gun was used across Europe and mostly against areas Europeans were trying to colonize, such as Africa. An account in the book by Winston Churchill shows just how destructive these weapons were against tribesmen who had never seen anything like machine guns. Machine guns had developed to be a significant and formidable weapon on the battlefield even in Europe. With a high rate of fire and using powerful cartridges, machine guns were one of the most important players in World War I combat. In the early stages of the war, militaries had not yet developed strategies to fight with the new weapons of the era. As a result, the casualties were massive. In the first two minutes of combat during World War I, an estimated 500 people were killed when a formation of Germans was mowed down by Allied machine gun fire. Over the coming weeks, both sides would adopt trench warfare as the open battlefields of the previous century had been rendered largely useless. This, of course, was largely due to the machine gun. However, machine guns were still too big and expensive to be used by soldiers. While more maneuverable than artillery, these weapons were largely stationary, save for when they were mounted on vehicles. One of the early solutions to this was the creation of the submachine gun, a smaller long gun capable of automatic fire with pistol cartridges. One of the first submachine guns created was the Thompson, later given the nickname of the Tommy gun. Here, Chivers explores how the Thompson was not only a mechanical predecessor of the AK-47, but also a social one. The Thompson was created right at the end of World War I, and as a result, militaries didn't really need it. To get around this, the manufacturer marketed itself to American civilians as a powerful weapon for self-defense. This marketing was hugely successful, but the guns largely ended up in the hands of organized crime. Coinciding with prohibition, crime syndicates in the United States developed to fill the new illicit need of society. As Chivers argues, the Thompson was a prerequisite for organized crime to become successful, allowing them to outgun smaller gangs and even the police. Gangs were so successful in leveraging these weapons 
that in 1934, the United States banned fully automatic weapons with its infamous National Firearms Act. Back on the battlefield, SMGs were effective weapons at close range, but they lacked the power, accuracy, and range of battle rifles, which most soldiers still carried. Battle rifles, often bolt action, tended to be longer, more powerful rifles, usually with a capacity of 5 to 10 rounds. These rifles, of course, were more powerful and accurate than other weapons available to infantry soldiers, save for the machine gun, but they still suffered from limited capacity, large size, significant recoil, and low rates of fire. Some innovations, like the semi-automatic M1 Garand fielded by the American troops in World War II, alleviated some of these issues, namely the rate of fire, but the niche for a smaller weapon that was still effective over range still existed and needed to be filled. The M1 carbine was an early example of this, but the example focused on by Chivers was the German Gewehr 43. With the Gewehr, the Germans not only created a semi-automatic rifle like the Americans, but also created a new cartridge to go with it. Most German rifles fired the powerful 7.92 by 57mm round, effective at ranges over 500 yards. But with this power came recoil, which made follow-up shots less accurate, as well as forcing the construction of the rifle to be bigger so as to deal with the force of the cartridge. To fix this, the Gewehr used a shorter 7.92 by 33mm cartridge. This round had the same diameter as the larger bullet so as to streamline production, but had less powder behind it allowing for a softer recoil impulse and a smaller rifle frame. This new class of cartridge, known as an intermediate cartridge, was central in the development of assault rifles. To this day, most rifles, including the AR-15, AK-47, and AUG rifles, use intermediate cartridges. The 7.92 by 33 mm round would ultimately be used in the world's first assault rifle, the Sturmgewehr 44, aka the STG-44. This rifle combined the power, range, and accuracy lacking in submachine guns with some of the smaller size, higher capacity, and impressive rate of fire that the standard rifles lacked. However, the STG-44 came too late for the Germans, and while a very effective weapon, was not able to turn the tide of the war. After the war, a Russian tank commander by the name of Mikhail Kalishnikov rocketed to fame. Before World War II, Kalishnikov's family was deported to Siberia during Stalin's dekulakizations campaigns. He later became an engineer and eventually enrolled in the Red Army where he fought the Germans. However, many parts of his life are muddy as Soviet propaganda often made him out to be a hero of the proletariat that interfaced seamlessly with the communist system. Throughout the book, Shivers seeks to give a more accurate representation of Kalishnikov's life and his intentions, and points out the many inconsistencies as they arise. For the gun buffs out there, you'll probably know the story of how the AK-47 was made, when an inspired Kalishnikov devised a rifle to give more firepower to a single soldier. While this is partly true, the creation of the AK-47 was actually much more bureaucratized than this. With the gun going through many iterations and being built not just by one man, but by a large team. The book recounts the trial and error process of the gun's creation, and how it was more so a product of the Red Army system than Kalishnikov himself. Various lighthearted stories appear in the book, like when Kalishnikov was informed that his rifle had been selected as the winner, and the man thought that it was a joke and it costed those who told him. Another story paints a moment of dread for Kalishnikov and his team when he heard the fire testing on the range stop suddenly. At first fearing his rifle had jammed, he was later informed that shooting had stopped because a moose had walked into the firing range. The final version of the AK-47 proved not only to give immense firepower to a single soldier, but also became known as one of the most reliable weapons ever. The AK-47 used a piston system, which reduced corrosion in the bolt compared to other rifle models that cycled gas directly into the chamber. The key to the AK-47's reliability was its use of large parts, which would provide enough momentum to get through debris, 
as well as the loose tolerances on the gun, giving space for debris to move when the gun was firing. With this reliability also came a lack of accuracy, partly due to the round being heavy but low velocity, and partly to the low tolerances. The AK used the new 762 by 39mm intermediate round, which was the same diameter for the as most the bullet, gaunt, but much shorter so as to have less recoil in size. From here, Chivers recounts the rise of Kalashnikov, both man and weapon. The man became a national hero, having his life propagandized and becoming promoted through the Red Army ranks. The gun began mass production across the USSR, and later in the Eastern Bloc and across China and other communist countries. The gun looks at the first use of the AK-47 in combat, during the Hungarian Revolution of 1956, and how the image of the AK-47 changed over time. Initially conceived as a weapon to help soldiers defend their countries from invaders, the AK became an instrument of oppression, allowing more technologically advanced militaries to tyrannize anyone they wanted. In another chapter of the book, Chivers looks not at the AK-47, but rather its infamous counterpart, the M16. Like the USSR, America decided to update its small arms after World War II. The M14 was the first choice of the American military, but the new gun was too much in the vein of previous rifles. Long, heavy, and hard to handle. In the jungles of Vietnam, the wooden furniture of the rifle warped, and the short sight lines rendered the rifle's advantage at longer range useless. Under Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, the US searched for an update. The eventual selection, unlike the Soviet process, came from the private sector. Eugene Stoner, a weapons engineer from California, had developed a new rifle known as the AR-15. The AR-15 fired an intermediate round, the 5.56 by 45 mm which had a very high velocity but much less recoil and weight than the previous ammunition of American rifles. Replacing wood, the rifle's furniture was made out of plastic, making it tougher in the elements while also making the rifle lighter. A soldier with an AR-15 could carry more ammo, be accurate yet fast with shooting, and not be bogged down with excessive weight. In theory, Shivers documents the process through which the AR-15 later turned into the M16 for the military, became the rifle for America. Sadly, this process was full of pitfalls, with bad testing and dishonest advertisement, as well as motivated bureaucrats in the Pentagon. When the M16 was issued, it became one of the most notorious weapons in American history, but not because it was so deadly. The rifle was extremely unreliable and jammed a lot, even in the most controlled of circumstances. Issues with corrosion, feeding errors, and the specialized ball powder the ammunition used often rendered the guns inoperable, to the point where some American soldiers abandoned their M16s in favor of the AK-47s they captured from Vietnamese troops. Shivers closes the book with a summation of how the rifle proliferated across the world and changed global politics. With the fall of the Soviet Union, as well as various other governments across the troubled regions of the world, weapon stockpiles became available to large numbers of people, many of whom either turned to organized crime or raising armies. In Uganda, after the sudden fall of Idi Amin's dictatorship, herdsmen in the north who had been repressed by the government infiltrated and raided a military base, upgrading from spears they had used for thousands of years up to assault rifles. These herdsmen then were able to rob their rivals, and eventually warlords sprang up across the region. In Albania, after a collapse of the economy and urging from the government, civilians raided armories to the point where after the stability returned, as much as 80% of the country's weapons had gone missing. With the proliferation of these weapons, African warlords challenged militaries, organized crime became the enforcers of law in the Americas, and terrorists in the Middle East wreaked havoc on the people and governments in their regions. By giving an immense amount of firepower to a small handful of people, the AK-47 revolutionized the monopoly on violence, and, as Chivers argues, plays a role in the destabilization of various regions in the world today. 
Shivers also looks at the personal cost of these weapons by recounting the story of a security guard who was shot over 20 times with an AK-47 at close range. The man miraculously survived, but was crippled for life and asked a rhetorical question for the rifle's inventor. Why make a machine that makes killing and wounding so easy? In the book's final stretch, Shivers looks at Mikhail Kalushnikov after the fall of the USSR. Here he explores his attempts at business after the fall of the socialist state, as well as Kalushnikov's personality and opinions on how the rifle has affected the world. Overall, I really liked this book and the way it looked at history. Most history books tend to focus on individuals or political systems, but this one actually focuses on a single machine. Politics and the like are of course integral to the book as well, but fundamentally the rifle served as a sort of equalizer, balancing both good and bad. The AK-47 was used by Albanians to defend themselves against roving mobs of gangsters in the 90s. It also allowed Kony to organize child soldiers against African governments. The gun was used by dictators and freedom fighters alike, sometimes at the same time. It allowed for a defunct government to hold on to control through force, or for a disorganized group of men to set fire to a whole country. The gun has made its way onto national flags and videos of terrorists, and in the West is seen as the bad guy gun. The AK-47's impact on the world is indisputable, and this book does an amazing job at making this argument. So that's it for this video guys, hope you enjoyed. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss an upload. YouTube's algorithm doesn't like videos that look at weapons or military history, so a lot of my videos you might not even see unless you do that. Also remember to check out my last book review on The Volunteer, which is a book that I liked even more than this one, and I will see you guys next time.